Тут вести удобно, можно просто взять нормальный палку и ей показать. This is better because uh, I, I wasn't uh, fully confident with this pointer, yeah. Especially when you want to show many things, then it's so easy. Because they cannot. Okay, I think we can begin. Um, welcome everyone. No, 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 no. Half a minute. Okay, um, welcome everyone to our uh, PCS IBS seminar today. And uh, we are uh, very uh, happy to host uh, still um, Professor Alexey Ustinov uh, from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, uh, who gave already a seminar yesterday. And today uh, we will hear about uh, slowing down microwave photons with superconducting qubits. So Professor Ustinov, please. Let's welcome the speaker. Thank you uh, for this charming introduction. Um, well, uh, I would like to tell today uh, a completely different work, which has to do with um, uh, superconducting qubits, the field which has been uh, developing very rapidly over the last uh, um, 20 years or so. Now, this uh, work was done by a very talented uh, uh, young student, Jan Brem, who graduated um, last year in my group and actually was working fully um, self-consistent independently on both fabrication and measurements of these devices. So this is the circuit which was fabricated by Jan Brem and I'm going to explain to you um, what uh, the circuit contains. Uh, the link scale here is 100 microns, so this is roughly a millimeter, so it's a really macroscopic uh, circuit which contains um, um, devices which behave as quantum two-level systems, actually multiple devices. So, um, excuse me, we need to go back, yes. So this uh, uh, story which I want to tell you has to do with the field uh, which can be also named after metamaterial. Uh, this field has been uh, around for quite a while, I think, for at least 20 years, more than 20 years. And the idea came from um, electrical engineering that uh, if you have um, uh, a medium uh, and you interact uh, with this medium, you study the scattering of light from the medium, then uh, usual material has atoms and uh, the space in between atoms is much smaller than the wavelengths. So the medium behaves itself uh, with uh, uh, certain properties which are described by um, um, the electric uh, um, permittivity and magnetic um, um, electric permeability and, and magnetic permittivity, uh, epsilon and mu, and uh, basically this uh, doesn't require uh, understanding of uh, interacting individual atoms with light, but rather consider uh, light interaction with a uniform medium because the wavelength is much larger than the distance between the atoms. And then the idea came about uh, to uh, mimic, so to say, nature. And uh, to um, in the whole story was uh, coming back to Vicilago and his idea of uh, using material, uh, hypothetic medium with negative epsilon, negative mu, which may bring the negative perfection index and so forth. But uh, the realization which was first uh, demonstrated was this uh, so-called split ring resonators, where you have 
basically an inductor and capacitor uh, in this uh, very uh, relatively compact circuit. However, the size of the structures uh, were, was uh, fixed by, by fabrication. This is just, just a printed circuit board with uh, dimensions of a fraction of a centimeter. And then if uh, the one designs uh, these capacitance between the path rings uh, uh, appropriately and the inductance appropriately, then this will be kind of uh, uh, resonating at a frequency which will be fixed by these dimensions. And then uh, close to the frequency of the resonance, you have either positive or negative phase shift of the oscillations in the circuit relative to the uh, uh, external stimuli. And this uh, basically allows uh, to realize uh, effectively um, negative uh, mu magnetic uh, um, permittivity in a very narrow frequency range close to the resonance. And the idea was actually to make uh, to combine these rings with also um, array of rods, which will have uh, similar resonance frequency, and then we have both epsilon and mu negative and so forth. Now, uh, this, Alexei, why, why do you need two of these rings? Uh, this is just the way to make it really compact, to increase the capacitance between them. So isn't one enough as an element? It will work as well, yeah. but the frequency will be higher. So frequency will be high, the resonance frequency will be high. So this makes it possible to make it rather compact with relatively low resonance frequency. Now, um, uh, sorry, three rings would Not much. I mean, this will you know, make the whole pattern complicated. This, anyway, it's, it's a little antenna which has its inductance and capacitance, and the resonance is the root of the effective one of a square root of the effective inductance times capacitance. So it's, it's nothing uh, as else as resonating. Which of course, has, of course, has particular uh, emission pattern in free space. It's, it's all details. Now, all this fixed by fabrication. Now, we started uh, um, working with superconducting uh, classical circuits, uh, basically squids. This is a superconducting ring with the Josephson junction uh, some years ago, and have shown that one can use superconductors instead of these lamp elements. And the advantage of, of superconductor is uh, to have, of course, very low loss because you need this. Uh, in particular, if you want to make the structure very small, um, this velocity in this structure will increase tremendously if you shrink the size of the, uh, of the structures. And also, you can apply magnetic field perpendicular to the uh, plane of the ring and then to, to change the frequency. So you can make this metamaterial also tunable in frequency. Now, this was uh, more like exercising in electrical engineering, but then um, uh, it, it's, it's obvious that uh, nowadays one can make also superconducting circuits which will behave as quantum two-level systems. And these quantum two-level systems uh, are superconducting qubits, which are also loops uh, with certain inductance and uh, junctions, they form some capacitance. And this is an example of a superconducting flux qubit, which actually contains uh, three Josephson junctions here. And it's actually, I want to mention that the spectrum of, the, uh, of this qubit as a function of magnetic field is exactly the spectrum of the system I showed yesterday, is this hyperbola uh, described by the formula square root of uh, delta square plus epsilon square. This is a flux qubit which has the minimum energy uh, transition between the ground state and the excited state at half flux quantum threading this this fault. <laughs> and back almost 10 years ago, um, together with a group of uh, Evgeny Ilichov in uh, Moscow, we were able to demonstrate uh, the behavior of array of qubits as an uh, effective medium as a quantum metamaterial in that case. The, the qubits were coupled to the resonator. So basically, um, superconducting circuits allow to not only to mimic electrodynamics, but also to play uh, with the metamaterials, the quantum mechanical view. So one can actually make a, a controlled array of, of uh, two level systems and make them interact with the incoming radiation. Now, um, the uh, superconducting circuits which we um, uh, can take uh, are derived from um, the uh, harmonic oscillator. This is a conventional harmonic oscillator with a capacitor and inductor, which has a, a parabolic dependence of energy on, uh, for example, flux in the inductor or charge in the capacitor. And then uh, when we replace this inductor by a Josephson junction, uh, which uh, is a nonlinear inductor, so its inductance depends on the current which is flowing through this junction, then the, uh, um, uh, the oscillator becomes uh, weakly nonlinear. And this is uh, the uh, circuit which is commonly called transmon, which is being used in uh, uh, prototypic uh, quantum computers made by Google and IBM and so forth. So this is essentially um, a Josephson junction shattered by capacitor, which uh, 
um, potential energy is not parabolic anymore, but has the shape of a cosine potential. It's not biased by any current, so it's actually cosine which extends uh, in this direction. And then, uh, due to the uh, weak negative anthermonicity, uh, the energy level separation between the ground state and the first excited state is slightly larger than energy level separation between the first and the second excited state. And um, all this is uh, very uh, well established now. So the circuit of, of this uh, kind, uh, as an example, is shown here. This is our geometry of our transform qubit, which contains now not one, but two Jeloson junctions here. And uh, we uh, prefer to have two Jeloson junctions because by applying the external local magnetic flux, we send the current through this, car this wire here. And then we can change magnetic flux in this, uh, in this loop. We can tune the critical current of the effective squeak. That means we can actually tune the resonance frequency, uh, the transition frequency between zero and one. So we can sort of adjust the resonance frequency individually of this, uh, this particular uh, circuit. And now uh, the frequency range where we prefer to operate is in the range of few gigahertz. And um, the harmonicity parameter, which actually uh, is quite important, if you want to use the system as a two-level system, then of course you don't need to begin to, to pay attention that there are also um, the other states, which are not uh, as quantum computing um, guys call it not computational states, but actually the states where the population can leak. This is the second excited state. So this difference of the two frequencies is um, uh, not huge. It's actually uh, only uh, in the uh, in the range of about a uh, few hundreds of megahertz uh, at that frequency. So you see that harmonicity is actually um, uh, less, less than 10%. So it's actually uh, only a few percent of harmonicity. But if you don't drive the system very hard, if you drive gently, then you could stay in the um, um, subspace of uh, states zero and one and not, don't have much leak in the second state. So that's how the computation is usually made um, in the uh, um, existing prototypes of quantum uh, processes. May I ask you one a question? That in the previous slide, uh, you, uh, you, you considered the uh, yeah Josephson uh, coupling pump uh, for this the tunnel junction, and uh, I just wonder that this uh, term uh, is uh, approximately correct or the. Uh, Depending on the size of the tunnel junction, do you need to consider some additional term? Is there a condition for? Uh, well, the size of the Joseph junction uh, modifies the capacities because there is also capacitance, intrinsic capacitance in the junction. And this, is, this goes in parallel with the external capacity. So I if you change the size of the junction, you also change that. So it's, there you can observe the, uh, and they introduce the effective uh, uh, Charging energy. The charging uh, energy uh, is uh, composed of the two capacitors here and yes. that one. I so see. you have to take into account both. I see. Thank you. Uh, in this uh, in this picture with these two uh, junctions. Uh, no, yes, on the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. uh, are the uh, the phase changes uh, the differences across the two junctions the same, or are they then different? So they are. Of course, if you apply the, the external flux, then the screening current flows like this, so the, right. the, the different. But the effective phase drop between the two, of course, uh, is uh, changed uh, accordingly. So, in principle, there are two modes. Like there is this um, inductance for the for the current for, for the um, uh, circular current and for the current flowing from here to there. But when when there is no uh, external magnetic field, wouldn't you then expect that you have some kind of double degeneracy of the levels? Because you have two junctions. Well, um, that the frequency of the uh, of the mode, which is associated with intrinsic okay. degrees of freedom, is much higher. So you don't have any interplay between those modes. So the, the, plus, the junction plasma frequency will be in the range of uh, several tens of gigahertz, while uh, the frequency of this circuit as a whole is only a few gigahertz. So that mode is very high in frequencies, as usually not relevant. So the picture saying that you have a set of levels which are associated, let's say, to one junction, then I take another junction, but also has a set of levels, <coughs> and when I take both, I have a like combination. But this is wrong at all. Very, very high frequency. So, but the, the lowest frequency mode will be uh, actually in the uh, in this range. That one is sort of decoupled from the high modes. Okay, so um, in this first experiment, which um, uh, I mentioned already, and in uh, some of the following experiments, we have done uh, measurements of the uh, array of uh, qubits coupled to uh, a, a microwave resonator, which, which basically is a, um, 
can be considered in the simplest case as a single mode activity. It's distributed activity, so there are also higher modes. Of, uh, and that's something which is described by the uh, James Cummings Hamiltonian. And if you consider um, multiple qubits, then it's uh, basically Davis Cummings Hamiltonian describing the uh, array of uh, two level systems coupled with the cavity. Now, in the talk today, I'm going to speak about uh, this situation where we basically have no uh, cuts here. So it's not a cavity, it's a transmission line. It's a one dimensional space. Microwave signal propagates along this line. This is the signal line, these are the ground lines. And then in the gap between the ground and the signal line, there are superconducting two level systems which are uh, sitting there at a distance which is much smaller than the wavelengths. So the idea is basically to look into the one dimensional space and put an artificial atom in one dimensional space and then see what happens if you put more and more of those atoms, how you really go from the one atom uh, story which has been started about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, into the um, um, limit where you have a kind of medium there. So uh, basically the, the model for that uh, describes the uh, propagating uh, photons here, um, which are described by this term of the Hamiltonian. Then you have uh, two level systems described by this term of the Hamiltonian. And then you have the interaction between those. And as uh, several theoretical works have shown out, um, shown before, uh, for example, I would quote that work, that one can integrate out photonic degrees of freedom and actually uh, comes back then with uh, effective Hamiltonian, which is standing here, where you have the, uh, which is describing the two level systems, superconducting qubits, which have effective interaction mediated by photons. So this interaction comes in two flavors. There is a collective decay, which is proportional to the cosine of the interqubit spacing. Mm -hmm. And there is an exchange interaction, which is proportional to the sign of the interqubit spacing. So basically, we, um, we don't put the, the qubits at the same position. They, of course, physically uh, uh, separated by some distance. This distance is much smaller than the wavelengths uh, of the incoming of uh, radiation of interest. But nevertheless, there is interaction there which depends on this distance. And uh, if you fill the whole space, the whole uh, uh, one dimensional space with these two level systems, then of course you have those stair terms oscillating and- uh, What is B? This B is, is the, the effective uh, um, um, operator which describes the, uh, the superconducting qubits where you don't include the photons, but just consider the interaction between them. And K is the vector of photons. K. We, we had uh, this, this mm -hmm. terms of photons, and then if you integrate them out, you are left with, uh, 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 you need to transform the, uh, the operators, and then you are, you are left with this, this type of operator. So you have basically the interaction between the qubits which uh, has this nonlinear term and also have this uh, other type of interaction, which has this. Uh, you allow like more this <laughs> single, uh, level occupation. You allow also this. No, this, to be this includes only a uh, single level. So, so only ground uh, state and first. So, so the, each qubit is just two level levels. In this uh, approximation, yes. What means then this uh, dagger B dagger B? Which we can only put in one part. I, I guess B means that you create or annihilate. Is, is this B is Fermi operator, bosonic operator, what is the box space would be? You write this is A. It's I'm understandable, C so okay. is understandable, but <laughs> no. what is I, I'm going to give you a theoretical uh, experimental talk. Sure. So uh, this is basically the outcome of the calculation, which I, I am not responsible for. And this is basically the answer I know is that uh, when you do this transformation and you integrate out photons. Then basically you are left with the effective interaction between the qubit, which is infinity with branch. This interaction is mediated by photons, but these photons are not present in this Hamiltonian. Oh yeah, I, I, I understand what, what is B. Sigma, it's, I understand. This is typical for a two-level system. And yeah. so what is B? Is it sigma plus? This is an effective uh, um, operator which corresponds yes. to interacting qubits via yes. photons. It's sigma plus. Sorry, plus. Sorry, B plus, B plus, what is equal to zero? B plus multiplied it's by the excitation of two level system. It's yeah. creation and the annihilation operator for excitation of two level system. B. So they are like yeah. they are so, so this is the point was sigma. Now it's yeah. Yeah. you have yeah. to check the this, I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, no, this, this community is dangerous to show Hamiltonians, <laughs> <laughs> but no, but it's not like this. You have to be Hamiltonian, and there is some <laughs> connection between these two Hamiltonians. But I think B is the Bodleian Hamiltonian. This is the transient, so it yeah, should be. Yeah, but then if you have, I mean, 
this term makes only sense yeah. if you have more than uh, one particle, uh, uh, allow more than one particle, whatever these particles are to be. No, we don't do it. Like, like, plus, so that's why I ask, can we occupy is, the second level? No, the answer is no. So then I don't understand. What is what is D plus D plus? Now, uh, the whole okay. story about the okay. so I, I is something I'm going to present you later. So I'm saying okay. that I'm, there is a, um, uh, the message of this, uh, of this consideration here for me is that by putting the qubits in the transmission line, I uh, can implement effective interaction, which is mediated by photons. That's all I want to say. And then I can study basically this interaction That's uh, okay. in the system, That's uh, okay. which uh, we construct. And one more question or two more questions. So the gamma ij, uh, where is it happening in this semitonian? Where is this term happening? I mean, gamma and j is the collective decay and exchange. Of where is it? Where do I see this in the in the upper line? Yeah, basically, okay. This is this is constant. If the spacing between the qubits is constant, uh -huh. so but they basically it takes it taken out of the of the sum here. This is uh, the, the, the qubit separation is always okay. This is more general considerations when the qubits are sitting in upper position. Okay. And then j is uh, a uh, no. So, so yeah, this is the way number. No, no, J, 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 J. Uh, exchange interaction. J, this is the effective um, uh, interaction between the qubits, which are separated by, by not necessarily nearest neighbors, but also like distances, right? Yes, that, that's gamma, but uh, the, the, the lower part is uh, the exchange interaction that's in chi. Um, okay, this is the uh, basically the uh, interaction which can, for example, allow you to swap the excitation from one qubit to another. So this is the effective interaction. So basically, if I tune the qubits to the same frequency, I can with this uh, this term, I can actually guarantee that they will interact uh, via the, uh, the the photons in the line, and uh, this interaction can uh, help me to uh, basically couple things. Right. And but based on this approach, actually, there is a, uh, um, an idea of implementing uh, alternative quantum computing architecture, where one can make interaction of qubits, superconducting qubits, all the whole. The approach is being followed by um, company Amazon uh, in collaboration with, um, as far as I know, Caltech, and they have been proposing this kind of um, architecture to, to build really universal quantum computer. But it's not something I'm going to speak about today. What you're talking is the uh, ion cube. Are you curious what? No. Uh, no, 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 this is yeah. all superconducting qubits. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, is there room here for super radiation? I mean, you yeah. have this two level yeah. this, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It's something I'm, I'm coming to. Yes, that's, that's it. By the way, kappa, uh, kappa mm -hmm. goes to infinity, so basically that means that this uh, fuzzy term, this, this Hubbard term there, which makes us so excited, basically is scaled to infinity, so you can forget about it. That's why I guess you don't have to worry. This is a two level system. Uh -huh. I'm not saying that this Hamiltonian fully describes all systems because you write kappa to infinity. That yeah. basically means that this kappa term can be forgotten about for the time being. Unless, yeah, I think that maybe you can think of this is of the boson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This kappa is yeah, yeah, not yeah. allowed. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's okay. And then step over Hamiltonian and go to real experiment. Let's try. <laughs> so, but still, uh, something which is uh, very simple. So, if you diagonalize uh, this Hamiltonian in, in, in single photon manifold, and basically you get the eigenmodes uh, for the uh, for the system. Now, this is a picture where the number of qubits is not infinity, but it's actually changing from uh, one or actually two to eight. And um, here, the eigenmodes are shown by uh, by these crosses here. So, there is um, the um, super radiant. Uh, um, mode, which actually is this one. Then there is a gap to dark modes, uh, which are subradian modes. Uh, they are characterized by this uh, uh, corresponding decays. And uh, the, uh, um, the system is characterized in by, by the band gap, which appears in the spectrum due to the interaction between the qubits. Of course, uh, the, the, the detailed position of this, uh, these crosses and all the spectrum depends very much on the separation between the qubits. But this picture is, is taken, uh, is calculated for the Example, which I'm now going to discuss uh, uh, in our experiment experiment later. So basically, the uh, there is a um, uh, a band where the waves don't propagate, and there is a band above and below where they do propagate. This is picture for the, of course, infinitely long system, but in short system, then there are discrete modes uh, shown there. So um, the uh, uh, there is a number of effects which were predicted uh, for this kind of. Uh, 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 array of two-level systems in, in one-dimensional waveguide. 
um, ranging from super and sub radians. Uh, this uh, devices were just uh, proposed for band, band gap engineering for generating uh, non classical lights, of course, like photon propagates through this, um, this uh, system. It entangles qubits and also comes out if, uh, as a non classical light uh, due to the interaction with two level systems. Now, uh, the, there have been, um, of course, many proposals, but the most challenging thing here is to make the superconducting qubits of the same frequency. If you take natural atoms, they are all identical. So by nature, if you replace one hydrogen atom by another, you will see no difference. In this system, we make these atoms by hands. And therefore, they, they are always different. It's like uh, the father Carla makes uh, uh, two different Pinocchio, and every Pinocchio is slightly different. It's not the same doll as, as the other one. So we need to really to make uh, uh, them, we try to make them identical to mimic the, uh, the medium, uh, uniform medium. And this is really experimental change. And what we tried to do first, very simple, we made uh, a long waveguide like this. And then we simply uh, did our best to make uh, really identical qubits there. And uh, uh, this was uh, all, all together 90 qubits. Uh, not very clever idea, of course. It's just a straightforward brutal uh, force approach. We had the array of which was uh, occupying about three wavelengths uh, along the, uh, the fast. Uh, this meandering was done just because we need to uh, sort of uh, have a very long line on the same on one chip. And uh, basically, we saw something. We saw the spectrum, which was looking like this. So we saw the band gap here um, at the frequency where most of the qubits were located. We saw that some of the qubits were away in the frequency. So this was not the same two level system as the others. But uh, it was really uh, demonstrating that uh, it's actually uh, an array of, uh, of two level systems because of the saturation. So if you increase the power, which is going along this axis, then this band gap vanishes at a particular power. And roughly, it vanishes at the power, which is uh, 18 dB larger than the power of vanishing single qubit signal, like this and or that one. So, but you, you, cannot, you cannot really do much uh, with uh, no, not knowing what are the frequencies of the, of the qubits. Therefore, we decided to go back and uh, actually make an array of um, uh, only eight qubits, but now all of them having controllable frequency. So, and this is uh, the circuit which came up. Um, uh, we came up uh, with. So uh, we were sending microwave in this one dimensional waveguide from left to right. Then we had this um, four qubits at, uh, on top and, and four qubits on the bottom. And each qubit had this control line, which I already mentioned. So in this, uh, by sending the current through this control line, we are able to individually adjust the, car the, uh, the frequency of this, uh, these qubits. And we can tune the single qubit in particular frequency, and then one by one bring the other qubits to the same frequency and see what happens. Yeah, yes. In the previous slide, that the, the power, the increasing the power means that uh, you increase the number of photons yes. in the, the, yes. the line. Exactly. So the uh, the vanishing this the band gap. Uh, why is the uh, photon number uh, related with the? Well, that's when you have uh, roughly 90, 90 photons in the system. When you saturate all the, uh, the, the qubits, then of course they don't really behave as two level systems anymore because the, uh, every qubit can take only one photon. Saturate means that they're all excited. They're all excited. Mm -hmm. They're basically uh -huh. switched off. Yeah. Like I see. I see. So they, 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 they related with the number of your qubits also. Yes, exactly. I see. The number of qubits on the resonance at this frequency. Now, um, so these are uh, eight transponds uh, which are capacitively coupled to the uh, common um, transmission line. The distance between them was uh, roughly um, 0.16 of the wavelengths. And uh, uh, we, uh, by purpose, made uh, the qubits very strongly coupled to the uh, transmission line. That means that uh, the uh, decay uh, was dominating uh, by emission of photons in the uh, transmission line. So decay in, in the qubits was not really intrinsic decay, but really limited by, by this coupling uh, to the uh, one dimensional free space. Why? Uh, well, because uh, if you couple very strongly, uh, basically, it seems the, the environment um, um, such that uh, the, um, the lifetime of the excited state will be very short. Basically, the qubit will, will sort of intend to give the photon away. If you if it's isolated, of course, lifetime will be much, much longer. So um, uh, now the um, first experiment to do is, of course, to 
uh, detune all the qubits and take just one qubit and put it in this transmission line and see what happens. And this is the uh, transmission um, um, coefficient as a function of frequency for one qubit sitting at a frequency uh, 7.88 8 gigahertz. Um, one qubit uh, generates a dip in the transmission. And uh, that basically means that if you send uh, photons there, not many, but few photons um, in this transmission line, such that uh, the, the, the photons excite the transition from uh, zero to one, the uh, qubit absorbs the photon and then re emits back the photon with opposite phase. This leads to the um, uh, minimum in the transmission, so the photon doesn't go through, but actually comes back. That's the final way. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this was uh, the experiment which was done uh, for the first time um, in Japan by Aleka Saki and co authors back in 2010. Basically, telling that uh, if you have uh, an atom uh, in one dimensional space, that the extinction of, of the uh, um, uh, transmission coefficient, so how much light get reflected, is can be very close to, to 100%. That's something which we also observe. We observe about 99% there. Now, the coherence times, as I said, uh, uh, will be then um, limited by the decay into the um, transmission line from this fit, uh, which we could uh, do consistently with. Uh, um, um, the uh, knowing the resonance um, amplitude and phase dependence uh, gives us the, um, the, the the lifetime about 25 nanoseconds and the, the phasing time of the order of 47 nanoseconds, almost twice the, the um, Q1. So it's actually uh, limited by the validity. Now, this all is uh, already known. Now, uh, what happens if you put more and more qubits? Until our experiments, there were experiments uh, done in the group of Andreas Walgraf, they were able to play with two qubits and also with three qubits. Then we went now to eight and, and see what really happens if um, we uh, can, can bring the qubit number uh, uh, far. So first thing, uh, when we bring to this one, uh, this resonance uh, two qubits, then we observe that the resonance changes the shape. There is something appearing there. And if we put three qubits, then this resonance is growing. And then if you put four, then uh, it's becoming very sharp. And if you put all eight to the same frequency, then uh, also according to the Lindblad simulation uh, of the system, we observe there is a, um, a peak uh, here corresponding to the appearance of the duct state. This is the brightest duct state and this is the second bright duct state, which is um, sitting next to it. Now, all this can be, of course, analyzed uh, with the uh, approach uh, with the, knowing the uh, eigen modes, which I uh, already mentioned. And uh, um, that's how it looks uh, again in transmission for eight qubits. But to be able to measure the line widths of the modes, um, um, we um, rather measure the reflection. So this is S21 here, basically transmission. And this is uh, reflection S22 coefficient. Um, so you will see uh, Lorentzian curve here for the uh, brightest of the duck modes. And this is the second bright of the duck mode. And from this Lorentzian, we actually um, can compare this with the prediction of theory. And, uh, well, the, uh, there is a prediction that the darkest so bright and, uh, um, state line bits should grow as the uh, power um, minus three of the number of qubits. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something which we actually were able to confirm by our data. This, uh, we, we saw this uh, scaling up to this number of qubits. This is the logarithm of the number of qubits here. So this is a side detail which I'm not going to <coughs> discuss today. Actually, I gave a talk about this already at the online seminar here. Uh, which was uh, in the workshop organized in the uh, um, pandemic time about two years ago. Now, this is uh, what um, is the um, prediction of the position of the mode. Now, the qubit number is increasing, qubit number on the resonance. This was one qubit, and this is how the modes move away, forming the band gap with increasing the number of participating qubits. So, um, in the uh, case here, when we have only eight qubits, then the, the band gap is about uh, 1.9. Uh, white, uh, the uh, Lorentzian widths of individual qubit. And if you go to infinity, really to very large, uh, long system, then the prediction should be 6.3, but we, of course, didn't uh, have this uh, in our experiment. We only limited it to that point. So, in fact, uh, exactly the same behavior one would observe uh, in an array of um, uh, harmonic oscillators, which will have the same frequency, because we are in a single photon manifold, so there is nothing quantum here. So it's actually uh, just behavior of harmonic modes um, in the um, in the system. So may I ask you one question? Yes. Does the band gap you observe be in, in, 
uh, indicates the, the, the effective copy between the, the, the qubits. The, how, how can you understand the meaning of this step like to get delta and omega? Well, this is a result of the generalization. So, um, well, for example, in the tight binding model, the, this, the hooking uh, parameter T actually determines the band uh, with the, you know, the energy. So, mm -hmm. I just uh, uh, guess that uh, whether it's, uh, there's some analogy between this, this uh, tight binding model and that this band gap uh, can be interpreted. Probably, uh, but uh, I, I, I cannot really. It's a bit, bit above my head to answer the question how this compares to the type binding model, but uh, this is the, the result of uh, the interaction between the qubits mediated by photons. Mediated by photons. Yeah. I see. No direct interaction between the qubits. They, they don't talk directly, so they only talk through the transmission line. So there is no, no capacity of interaction with, between them uh, directly. But the, in, in your uh, uh, experimental setup, uh, probably the capacity. Coupling between the qubits it was very, very small. So small. it was only uh, each qubit was coupled to the transmission line. And then uh, the transmission line was coupled to another qubit. Of course, this is uh, kind of uh, second order coupling, but direct ca capacitance was very, very, very small. Thanks. Okay, so uh, this is an example uh, that we could really uh, describe everything with uh, um, uh, simulations uh, using the um, eigen modes and also. Complete intensities using Gilbert equations. If we put seven qubits on resonance and tune uh, the qubit A through, then we see that some modes are uh, fading out, then they appear again. Some modes get emphasized. So this is a comparison you know, with, the, uh, with the calculation and the agreement is pretty nice. So we are rather confident that we understand what is happening in the system. Uh, this is all, of course, of course again, a uh, single photon manifold. Now, um, let us go to something quantum. Uh, as already we discussed, uh, if we increase the power of uh, incoming uh, radiation, which means increase the number of incoming photons, then two-level system uh, gets saturated, cannot uh, uh, take more than one excitation. So basically the properties of this, uh, uh, the circuits uh, saturated particular power. In a single qubit, the saturation was about this power, and uh, uh, if we make a line scan along this direction, this will be uh, the dependence of the, um, of the, uh, um, um, deeps, uh, depths of the of the deep uh, in the transmission as a function of power. Now, if we put eight qubits, uh, then uh, of course we, we see much wider range because we have appearance of the band gap, but at the same frequency, we have this plot here for um, for eight qubits, and this is uh, basically showing that at least uh, the situation um, uh, shows us uh, a reasonable expectation um, that the two two level systems with increasing number of qubits and growing number of photons will also show uh, comparable properties. Now, more interesting quantum um, property is uh, doing something what people also do with atoms. And this is uh, an effect which includes also the um, second excited state of, of an atom. If uh, um, um, one applies um, pump radiation at the transition frequency between one and two, then one obtains, obtains the addressing of the uh, first excited state uh, at the frequency, which is proportional to the uh, power or uh, square root of power of incoming quantum radiation. So basically, this is the Otterton's uh, effect, which was also observed for a single qubit uh, in the group of um, Aleka Stachyev uh, in Japan that time. Um, to my former student, uh, uh, Farouk Abdumalikov, uh, is the first author of this paper. It was repeated in Chalmers later on. And basically, uh, it tells us if you apply now the resonance, the, 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 the driving tone, at this transition frequency and then measure low power transmission uh, at this frequency, instead of observing a dip, now this is uh, with a zero um, driving tone applied, in, instead of measuring this uh, just dip, we observe now two dips, uh, and this is uh, the appearance of the, uh, the satellites uh, according to the prediction of the Otterton's effect, which was previously observed uh, uh, of course, um, uh, in atoms and well known as quantum optics. Now, um, this is the uh, prediction of the uh, autotone splitting for eight qubits according to theory. And uh, this is the result of the experiment. You see reasonable agreement, but uh, there are some um, dark shade here. For example, this additional line uh, disagrees with this prediction. And we think this uh, disagreement here is due to the fact that um, um, when we tune the qubits in the resonance uh, and make all the, for, for all of them, 
zero one transition to be the same frequency, uh, because qubits are physically different, it doesn't mean the transition frequency of one two is the same in all qubits. And actually, one qubit here was off. So the following experiments I'm going to show was actually that we um, excluded uh, actually one bad qubit, which was really of the frequency and only played with seven qubits in resonance, then the agreement was, was much better. So basically you have the appearance of the uh, transmission window. This is the, uh, uh, if you want, chromatically induced transparency, uh, which has been discussed a lot uh, in atomic physics. Basically you, you can apply this uh, driving tone at a frequency which is different from your frequency of interest. And then by applying this tone, suddenly in the gap when you had, when you had no transmission, you see uh, an appearance of transmission again. So this is the uh, induced transparency by the driving tone at different frequencies. So um, then uh, we uh, look um, what, we, what, what is happening if we increase um, slowly the amplitude of the driving tone. This is um, actually um, the driving tone when the, uh, the, the transmission window only appears. And then if you drive harder and harder, then this window becomes wider and then wider and wider. So this basically looking back, this is increasing uh, and moving along this axis in power and increasing uh, the, the driving field uh, amplitude basically makes the transmission window wider and wider. Experimental data looks like trippy, not trippy. Uh, that's what I said. So there is a uh, additional peak here. You mean this one? Yeah. And we believe this is due to the fact that uh, one of the qubits was having uh, um, the transition uh, frequency at one, two, significantly different from the rest of the qubits. And in the following experiments, we included this qubit, uh, excluded these qubits and actually played with only um, seven qubits. I will show you the picture when this bad qubit was excluded. So in the calculation, they assume it's only single qubit case. Uh, in the calculation, uh, we had identical qubits, identical, identical qubits, uh, also eight of them. So this is the full simulation using Lindbergh equations. And this disagreement actually tells that the experiment, the qubits are not identical. All right, so we have almost a flat band here. Um, actually, uh, um, the, the slope uh, uh, in the, uh, of the dispersion is very, very weak. And uh, the one, um, of course, uh, can associate this slope with the group velocity of electromagnetic waves in this transmission window. And one of the applications of this electromagnetically induced transparency in atomic physics was that uh, at the driving level where this transparency window is appearing, the group velocity is actually very, very low. Group velocity is proportional to the derivative of the omega over the k frequency over the wave number. And uh, this is something which we can actually um, uh, take uh, now from the data. So um, you see that now seven qubits are in, in the resonance. This is the Otlaton splitting, ATS observed for <coughs> seven qubits. We don't see any more pronounced branching here, so it looks better. And then if we cut at this point here, then uh, this is where the uh, transparency window is uh, the, in the beginning appearing. Uh, we have uh, uh, in the argument of the uh, transmission uh, S21, um, the, um, can be shown rather straightforwardly that the group velocity is proportional to the inverse derivative dk over the, the omega. And uh, from this data, we can identify this slope to be associated with the, um, with the group velocity. And uh, from that, we could uh, extract the, uh, the group velocity um, uh, expected from this uh, spectrum. So there are three cutting lines here, orange one, um, this uh, uh, purple one, and the um, cyan one. And you see that actually the slope here is, is changing. So uh, this data we could use uh, to calculate what is the velocity of electromagnetic waves uh, propagating in this transparency window. And um, the comparison, with um, um, with uh, the theory is uh, shown here. So these are the points which we measured. Okay, this is the uh, group index. So this um, basically group index characterizes how slow is the uh, 
propagation of, of um, microwaves in this transmission line. And uh, this is uh, where we were going really to um, very small power. At very small power, we have very narrow window. We have the flattest dispersion. And that's where the uh, group index is maximal. We were able here to reach almost a uh, factor of 2000. So we slowed down microwaves by a factor of 2000, this, this one dimensional line, by um, uh, inducing the autotons splitting. There is some uh, analysis here, which was done by Sasha Padumni, who is co-author of this paper. Uh, we actually, he described the uh, two limits here. One of them uh, agrees uh, more or less with the data at high power and at low power, the agreement is uh, only quality, but not quantity. So uh, I will not talk about that, but if you're interested, but I said, yes, yeah. one question that uh, I just, uh, if you observe the, the frequency shift uh, as a function of control power uh, for a single uh, qubit instead of seven qubit, uh, do you expect to see any change or dependence on this uh, control power? Um, I, I think I didn't get quite the question. So if one of the, one of the qubit is different, then? Yeah. The, um, the, the transition, uh, uh, do you expect to see any some, for example, the multi photon process or uh, the, any some some anomalous transition uh, 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 induced by the multi photon, uh, which uh, may induce the additional frequency shift of the? Well, we apply photons at very narrow frequency range. So, multi photon process would require very different frequencies if you are going to hit the same transition. So uh, we think that um, um, harmonicity was, uh, at any rate, uh, much larger than the window in frequency which we are looking at. So multi photon process, they would become important for much larger power when the autotone splitting becomes so large that actually you will uh, unavoidably also occupy the, uh, the, the, the multi photon uh, transitions at higher levels. Uh, Thanks. Thank you. All right, so um, now um, this is, of course, just some exercise with uh, uh, the measured dispersion curve. But as experimentalists, we always were interested really to make a uh, measure directly. Uh, so if we are uh, um, able to prove that uh, the microwaves are really slowed down by this large factor of almost 2000 in the system. And to, um, to demonstrate that, we went uh, and measured the time, uh, performed the time result measurements of propagation of 50 nanoseconds Gaussian pulses uh, propagating at the frequency shown by the, uh, this uh, black dashed line. Now, here one has to pay the attention uh, on the following fact that uh, if you um, if you have very narrow um, frequency range where the uh, slow slowdown of the uh, of the light is expected, then of course this frequency range should be uh, larger then the spectral width of the pulse which you apply. So basically the, the, the duration of the pulse, 50 nanoseconds, which in Fourier space will be also Gaussian pulse, will occupy a certain frequency range. And that means actually we cannot really go very deep inside this uh, kind of corner here. We, can, we should stay somewhere away where the one or 50 nanoseconds frequency is going to be uh, not larger than the gap where we are going to observe this, uh, uh, this, uh, this delay. And starting from that point, we were able to then move step by step with increasing power into the transference window. Now, these pulses are shown here. Uh, now, for um, better visibility, the width is compressed by a factor of 20. And these are the data uh, shown at different, uh, at different power. And one can actually see that the position of the pulse, which arrives at different power, actually is, is different. So uh, when we analyze now the, this data measured in uh, the direct time result fashion, then um, we observe the, uh, this triangular data, and you see the agreement um, with the measured from the spectral um, uh, data of the uh, transmission is, is really very, uh, very reasonable. So we are able to directly measure the uh, um, delay of the, um, the slow, slowing down of the microwaves by um, the group index uh, over 1,500. So, um, Again, this is a picture of, of Jan Brem who did these measurements. This was uh, the uh, last result, uh, the main result of his PhD um, thesis published in this paper last year. So, um, 
very briefly, I want to mention a uh, very recent experiment which we did uh, with um, 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 in the uh, in Moscow group, which I was collaborating until terrible events of the uh, the North started last year. Um, this was an experiment done with uh, um, again multiple controlled uh, qubits coupled to the cavity. Here we were able to actually measure uh, 25 uh, top-level systems with all controlled fluxes uh, placed in the concavity. And the prediction of the Davis Cummings model uh, uh, tells that the um, uh, interaction strengths of the qubits with the uh, with the cavity should uh, increase the square root of the number of qubits. So the anti-crossing, which one would observe, actually should go as a square root of the number of participating qubits, also prediction of the superrated state. Uh, in a single mode activity. And that's something which was observed. I just added the slides for, uh, for those who might be interested uh, to see but how far one can go with the uh, Davis Cummings model um, uh, quantum simulator uh, with superconducting qubits. So we are confident that we can actually go beyond that. And this is the experiment which is now going to be um, repeated with a improved design. The problem here was that this was a circuit um, made that time in Moscow in Bauman University. And uh, uh, the, the, the design was a bit handicapped that this um, multiple readout resonators for individual qubits uh, were um, um, having the frequency which was uh, close to the frequency of the individual qubits. So we had a parasitic resonances due to the readout resonators. And that actually uh, didn't prevent us measuring the increase of the, of the coupling strengths. This is avoided level crossing. Uh, this is the resonator frequency. And here we tune through the array of qubits here we tune four qubits, here we tune seven qubits, here we tune 16 and 21. And you see that actually the gap, the subordinate crossing gap, uh, which is a measure of the interaction of the qubit array with the cavity, is growing according to prediction of uh, Davis Cummings uh, model. So there is, I hope there will be more experiments on that. And it's very, very interesting because uh, the scaling, the square root scaling, which was nicely observed here, uh, allows to, uh, let's say, um, study the uh, robustness of the superrated mode uh, uh, relative to the spread of parameters relative to the disorder. And actually, in this particular um, paper, the, pay, the attention is paid on the uh, study of uh, artificially the use disorder on the um, sharpness on the magnitude of the um, Davis Cummings uh, coupling stacks. So, um, sorry, may I ask you one question? Yes. How, how did you uh, uh, control the epsilon in the experiment? Is this the gate bias? How I control what? E epsilon, x axis. Uh, this is the frequency, sorry. The notation is different. This is the, the no, excuse me. This is, uh, uh, pardon. This is the, um, the frequency of the detune. So, yeah, this yeah. is basically the frequency which is uh, associated with this scale here. So, here they coincide. Uh, and then uh, if you go away, it's like uh, um, tabulating this curve uh, along this axis here. So it's like mirroring this axis with respect to that one. Yeah, the detuning parameter, how can you control the detuning parameter? Uh, we change the, uh, the local magnetic fluxes in uh -huh. middle qubits simultaneously. Ah, uh, simultaneously. So we have 21 pipe qubits. We have 21 qubits. Uh, yeah. Largest Sorry. here and then uh, all 21 qubits, we, we know what we need to do, uh, how large we should be the current sent individually through individual qubit to make all their frequencies to be the same. I see. So this is quite a sophisticated experiment because we need to control 21, 21 current and we need to measure the uh, parasitic interaction between the qubits. Like for example, if you change the current in one qubit, uh, it influences also the other qubits. So what we do, we measure uh, 25, uh, for each qubit, we measure all 21 others, and then we um, make a, a kind of a interaction matrix where we have um, most uh, largest element along diagonal, but also some off diagonal elements. Then we diagonalize this matrix, and then we know which currents we need to apply uh, in the array of 21 lines to uh, address one specific qubit without influencing others. You expect some information from the so-called replica sample and the uh, uh, tune uh, uh, based on this information uh, the average parameters in this. Uh, no, this interaction is, is mostly due to the static uh, the coupling between the qubits. So the, the, the dynamic coupling was not really uh, going um, taken into account here. 
Dynamic means that actually we consider the qubits interact only with the resonator, only with the cavity, not between them uh, directly. So we made a really by purpose this kind of long meander line uh, where qubits work quite far apart. But the static interaction due to the uh, long distance uh, parasitic inductances between the lines uh, is always present. We need to take this into account uh, by diagonalizing uh, the inductance metrics. Thank you. All right, so this is uh, basically the main story which I told you about uh, slowing down light uh, with uh, eight qubit metamaterial uh, that we were able to slow down microwaves by factor of almost uh, uh, 2000 and indirect pulses 1500. Now, uh, this, this whole story um, uh, can be interesting for quantum memory, but unfortunately, um, the quantum memory requires uh, some advantage uh, of the uh, lifetime of this light stored in the array of qubits. And this is not possible in our system where we have levels above each other. So uh, this can be um, uh, remade uh, with the Lambda system uh, where we would have a uh, longer lifetime of the middle states. Um, so uh, it doesn't really uh, uh, help uh, building quantum memory yet, but uh, at least slowing down microwaves in the Odlaton uh, transmission gap is, is uh, demonstrated. And that's another different direction working with qubit metamaterials where uh, we can work on um, with qubit array uh, on the same chip uh, with individual control of um, many qubits um, uh, to demonstrate collective uh, super radiant states uh, uh, with the cavity uh, with uh, scaling of the uh, interaction strengths proportional to the square uh, root of the number of qubits. So uh, with that, thank you for your attention. Okay, questions. You want to satisfy? Thank you. We have all different exhausted amount of questions. <laughs> so, uh, Alexei will still be here, uh, maybe a couple of, I don't know, some short time today, and maybe also some. Hours tomorrow, so if you have more questions to him, just arrange for time. Thank you very much. Thank you.